So chapter five is all about thermochemistry, uh, and, and we will be looking at the relationships between chemical reactions and their energy change associated with those reactions. So first we'll look at um, some, some definitions here. A lot of this might be similar to something you've done in physics. If you've taken physics class, you've probably heard a lot of this terminology before. So the nature of energy, energy is just the ability or the capacity to do work. And we define work as the energy used to cause uh, an object that has mass to move. Um, and energy is kind of re related to work and heat. So heat is the energy used to cause the temperature of an object to rise. So you're probably familiar with temperature and heat. Uh, and then work, you're just you're trying to move an object that has mass. Uh, energy kind of comes in two forms. You have kinetic energy and potential energy. You've probably heard those terms before. Kinetic energy, that's the energy of motion. Uh, you can calculate it as one half mv squared, where m is mass and v is velocity. I think there's one homework problem where you have to use this equation. Um, potential energy is uh, the energy an object has um, due to its position or chemical composition. Um, and so when we're talking about chemical composition, we're looking at you know energy being stored in bonds. It's stored energy. Potential energy is like your stored energy. Um, or in this picture here, this biker has a lot of potential energy just due to her position. She's on top of the, of the hill, and then she's going to convert her potential energy into kinetic energy as she starts moving. And so you can convert from one form of energy um, to another, but you can't create it or destroy it. And we'll talk about the first law of thermodynamics in a little bit. Um, some other important things we need to talk about when we're dealing with potential energy. Um, you can calculate... Uh, electrostatic potential energy um, using this basically Coulomb's law where you have a constant here and then Q1 and Q2 are the charges on the two particles. So suppose you have an ionic compound, you have like, like sodium chloride, and you want to figure out what's the energy associated with the electrostatic potential energy, what kind of energy is holding those two ions together. Um, Q1 and Q2 are the charges on the ion, so like we'd have like a plus one and a minus one here. And then D is the distance between them. So that would be the distance between those two particles, which is related to their uh, the, the distance between the two nuclei, how big, the, how big the atoms are, how big the ions are, or the particles. You can relate this to any kind of particles. So this is distance. Now, if you remember, like charges repel each other. So this is plotting um, energy over here in, in distance. So the closer they get, so the smaller the distance are, is, um, if they are, if they have the same charge, they're going to repel each other. So that's why the energy is going up. If they're opposite charges and they get really close together, then they're going to be uh, attracted to each other, and that energy will go down. All right. So for this part, just remember that like charges repel and opposite charges attract. As far as units of energy are, are concerned, uh, we're going to look at the joule, and a joule is a kilogram meter squared per second squared. Um, I, I will give you this, to, so you don't have to memorize these, these units. We'll do a few problems and um, where, where you're going to need to have the mass in kilograms. Uh, so that's a kilogram meter squared per second squared. That's a joule. That, that's our, our um, SI unit of energy. You may have you may be familiar with a calorie. You may have heard of calories before. Um, this is the food calorie, which is really a, a thousand little calories or one kilocalorie. Um, and one calorie is 4.184 joules. So there's a relationship between, this is just the conversion factor between joules and calories. And I always give you conversion factors, so you don't have to worry about that one either. So now let's look at um, the system and the surroundings and some more definitions. So the system is, you know, whatever you're looking at, whatever's of interest to you. Um, in this example over here, we go. In this example over here, the molecules are your system, and anything else is the surroundings. So the, the piston here, the, the cylinder and the piston, that would be your surroundings. Um, together, when you add everything up together, the system plus the surroundings, that's called the universe. And we'll look at that later. We have some more definitions. So the system is kind of whatever you're interested in studying, and then the surroundings is everything else. Okay, so you can transfer heat and work. Um, it can be... In, can be transferred from the system to the surroundings or the surroundings to the system. Um, so again, work, we go back over here to our, our definition. What is work? It's, it's the energy used to cause an object that has mass to move. So we'll look at work and heat and how they're related and how that relates to the system and the surroundings. 
So energy can be transferred as heat, right, or work. And so heat, when we're talking about heat, heat always flows from hot stuff to cold stuff, right? So from the warmer object to the cooler object. So if you had a drink that had um, ice cubes in it, the ice cubes are actually warmed. They melt um, from, the, and they absorb the heat from the um, the surrounding liquid that is uh, it's warmer. So heat's going to always flow from hot stuff to cold stuff. Uh, what else do we have here? Energy can be converted from one type to another. So we'll look at that again. We can convert from um, kinetic to potential energy, all those sorts of things. Uh, some really quick definitions of different types of systems, how we can define different systems. You can have an open, closed, or isolated system. An open system, and, and all, all these definitions have to do with whether or not you can transfer, um, you can exchange matter and energy, or just energy, or, or neither atom or, at matter or energy, um, between the system and the surrounding. So if you have an open system, an open system, uh, you can exchange matter and energy. So this is something like an uncovered pot of water. So suppose I have some water here, and I'm... I'm uh, a pot and I'm, I'm boiling some water. Let's draw a little droplets of water here. Um, and I heat it up. This is my flame. Pretend we're camping or something. So we put that on there. The heat's going in there. And then what's going to happen to this water as it starts to boil? And then it's going to evaporate. And so it's going to leave my system. So I can exchange matter um, and energy with the, between the system and the surroundings. In a closed system, so to close the system, all I would do is kind of put uh, a lid on this pot and now I can boil this water but it won't leave the system because it's covered but I can still put heat in there right so I, I have heat going into my system um, but matter can't be exchanged and if I had an isolated system so my isolated system is going to be closed and it's going to be perfectly insulated so if I had a uh, perfectly insulated thermos where it really all the heat stays in there or if it's cold the cold stays in there um, and there's a lid on it so the matter can't be exchanged either so that would be an isolated system where you can't exchange heat or matter